finish up chapter four of, Boaz, of uh, Ruth, chapter four, the book of Ruth today. And um, what we're going to see in chapter four is that chapter four is the opposite, especially when we look at our main character, or one of our main characters, Naomi, is that chapter four is going to be the opposite of what chapter one was. So if you remember, the, in chapter one, um, Naomi comes back to Bethlehem, accompanied by Ruth, and what are the key things that she says? She says, don't call me Naomi anymore. By the way, Naomi means pleasant. Instead, call me Mara, which means bitter. In fact, what she said was, she said, we left to go to Moab full. In other words, I had a husband, I had two sons. And then she says, but I'm returning to Bethlehem empty. And those are her words. I left full, I've come back empty. And so that's where my premise is that she is a, she's just a bitter woman that's come back and it says don't even don't even call me by my name because she says in chapter one she says the Lord has been bitter towards me and harsh towards me and so she can't see beyond her circumstances so that's one of the big applications that we'll look at as we go through this today is that are we dwelling on our circumstances or are we dwelling on the promises of God and by the way God doesn't promise as we all know I hope we know God doesn't promise that life is going to be perfect or even good or even, you know, I saw a couple this week walking down the street, probably, I don't know, 45, maybe, bad judgment, hey, 50, and, 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 I, and I noticed that they were, pushing a, they were pushing a cart, you know, like a baby cart type thing, and where we are over there, there's so many old people that push their dogs around and baby strollers. It's, uh, oh no, I mean really. Yeah, Pinellas County is a lot of old people. They push their dogs and stroll. It's, yeah, it's crazy. So I kind of in this habit to look down. Is it a, is it a baby or is it a dog? Well, it was a young man, and it probably 35 years old, 30, 35, who clearly had cerebral palsy or something, and it just it, it just made me stop and go. You know what? My circumstances aren't that bad. You know, you look at that, right? and you started flashing through it. Remember, I have a friend, you know, they have a, a child who was born that way, and, and Richie is, wasn't supposed to live past like 15, he's 38, and, you know, he's got the mind of the three. And I sit there and think, wow, Raymond, don't, don't, don't wallow in, in your circumstances that go on, because it's always there. So that's where Naomi is, and so we see this with Naomi, and, and I believe this, we see this, because when, when you go to chapter 2, Ruth says, hey, I'm going to go clean in the field. You know, Naomi doesn't say, well, let me come join you. She's just sitting back being bitter. So what we're going to see today, though, is if you remember, my view of uh, Naomi and her plan for Ruth was the wrong plan. But because of the integrity, the right choice that Boaz and Ruth made, they didn't consummate what would have been consummating a marriage on the threshing floor by, by them coming together and having sex, which is what consummates a marriage in those days. Yes, sir. Let me read you what uh, John MacArthur said about this. He says, since Boaz was a generation older than Ruth, this overture would indicate Ruth's desire to marry Boaz which the older, gracious Boaz would never have initiated with a younger woman. So that's the custom back then in that part of the country or world. Is that that's how a woman would propose to a man. But that's not in Scripture. That's my point. I know, it's in the footnotes. Yeah, it's not in Scripture. <laughs> so if you, did, but if, if you go back and you look, if, if you look at the concept of, not concept, if you look at the law of the kinsman redeemer, it's incredibly detailed. In fact, to the point where if somebody, if I'm the kinsman redeemer and I refuse to redeem this person, she can take the sandal and smack me. I mean, it is a it is a major deal. So it goes into very finite detail about the law of the kinsman redeemer. So this idea that oh, it was a custom. I don't live by customs. I live by what the word says. So if the word says that, so I, again, look, you can. I, it doesn't matter if you disagree with me. And I really am not standing up here on a high horse. <laughs> My view of it is Naomi tried to subterfuge the thing. Woman's not supposed to be on the threshing floor. Clearly says that. Do not let anybody see you. You're not supposed to be seen here. So, hey, by the way, um, I don't know about you, but times from then to now haven't changed. If a woman sneaks up on 
and, and, and climbs up under the bed after your, your harvest and your night of eating and drinking, and she puts on her best clothes and her best perfume. Sorry, I, I, I don't see, oh, lay at his feet, follow some Near Eastern custom. It's not scriptural. So, again, if you disagree, that's cool. It doesn't bother me a bit. But it flows, I think it flows, because we see how bitter she is. She says, I've come back empty. I left full. Look at my circumstance. When I left, I had a husband and two sons. I've come back empty. I don't have anything except a Moabite daughter-in-law that's coming through. So, what, at the end of chapter, uh, at the end of chapter three, when Naomi, when Ruth goes back to Naomi, verse eighteen, Naomi says, "Wait, my daughter, until you know how the matter turns out. For the man, that's Boaz, will not rest until he has settled this idea of the kinsman redeemer." And remember what he said was, he told Naomi on the threshing floor. He said, number one, hide, stay here till morning and sneak out so nobody can see you. But he also said, there is a kinsman that is closer in, in relation than I am, and I will settle this matter. So then we walk into chapter 4. It says, now Boaz, well, we'll just read chapter 4. Now Boaz went up to the gate and he sat down there. And behold, the Redeemer uh, of whom Boaz spoke was passing by. And he said, come over here, my friend, sit down. And he came over and sat down. Then he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, Sit down here. So they did. And he said to the Redeemer, Naomi, who has returned from the land of Moab, has to sell the plot of land which belonged to our brother Elimelech. I, so I thought I would inform you by saying, before it, Buy it before those who are sitting here and before the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if not, tell me that I may know. For if there is no one except you to redeem it, and I am after you, I will redeem it. So clearly he's saying, Look, if you're not interested in redeeming, I'll do it. <clears throat> then Boaz said, On the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you must acquire Ruth the Moabitess, the widow of the deceased. Now watch this. Here's the key. In order to raise up the name of the deceased on the inheritance. So remember, the kinsman redeemer, when you would do that, is you're raising up. So even though if Boaz, if, or if the redeemer redeems Ruth, what they're doing is they're redeeming Elimelech's name. So all of those things will go to Elimelech. So you're raising up the name of the deceased for his inheritance. That way his name's not blotted out. Then the Redeemer said, I cannot redeem it for myself, otherwise I would jeopardize my own inheritance. Redeem it for yourself. You may have my right of redemption since I can't redeem it. Now this was the custom in the former times of Israel concerning the redemption and the exchange of land. To confirm this in any matter, a man removed his sandal and gave it to another. And this was the way of the confirmation of Israel. So the Redeemer said to Boaz, buy it for yourself, and he removed his sandal. That's, that is, by the way, that's the exact detail that's in the law that says this is what you're supposed to do. So you see, they're following every detail. He says, look, I'm not the closest relative. This guy is. So you redeem her. And he does what? He follows what the law says. He says, I'm not interested in redeeming her. You can redeem her. It takes off the sandal. In other words, that seals it in front of the, the elders and all the witnesses that are there at the gate. And the gate's like the town hall, right? That's where everything happens. They come together uh, to meet and go through things. So the Redeemer said, Buy it for yourself and move the sandal. Then Boaz said to the elders and all the people that were out, You are witnesses today that I have bought the land from the hand of Naomi and all that belonged to Elimelech and all that belonged to Chilion and Melon. Uh, furthermore, now watch this, same, same words from verse 5 and 10. Furthermore, I have acquired Ruth the Moabitess, the widow of Malan, to be my wife. Wow, well, now watch this. Not just to be my wife, in order to raise up the name of the deceased on his inheritance. To raise up, see, go back to verse 5. In order to raise up the name of the deceased. So the idea was, I'm not just going to marry her. I'm going to give her a child, and hopefully a son, that will then have the inheritance of Elimelech. So, what you have to think about, well, let me, let's read the rest of the text, and we'll come back to it. Um, and here's what he says. I will raise up the name of the deceased of the inheritance, so that the name of the deceased will not be eliminated from his brothers or from the court of his birthplace. You are now my witnesses. Again, law, detail, take the sandal off. There's got to be multiple witnesses there. Witnesses have seen it. They're going to acknowledge. We saw it. This guy gave up his redemption right. Boaz is taking it. And all the people who were in the court and the elders said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home, like Rachel and Leah, 
both of whom built the house of Israel, and may you achieve the wealth of Ephrathah, however you say that, uh, and become famous in Bethlehem. And basically, that's the region of Bethlehem. Moreover, may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore through Judah, through the descendants whom the Lord will give to you by this woman. So Boaz, and, so Boaz took Ruth, she became his wife, and he had relations with her, and the Lord, here's a key thing, the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. Then the women, the women said to Naomi, the women of the town said to Naomi, Blessed is the Lord who has not left you without a redeemer today, and may his name become famous in Israel. May he also be to you the one who restores life and sustains you in old age. For your daughter-in-law loves you better than, uh, than seven sons has given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child and laid, it on her, and laid him on her lap and became his nurse. And so the neighbor women gave him a name saying, A son has been born to Naomi, and they named him Obed. He is the father of Jesse, who was the father of David. Now from these generations, the, from, now these are the generations from Perez. Perez father... <coughs> Hezron, Hezron fathered Ram, Ram fathered Aminabad, Aminabad fathered Nashon, Nashon fathered Sam, Salmon, Salmon fathered Boaz, Boaz fathered Obed, Obed fathered Jesse, Jesse fathered David. And then that's repeated, I think it's Matthew chapter 1. That's what that is. So, now, Naomi predicted what was going to happen in chapter 3, verse 18. Once Naomi, when Ruth came back and said, this is what he said, he didn't, in essence, we didn't sleep together. He told me there was somebody else that was closer in line to redeem, but he said he would solve the problem one way or another. And so Naomi says, wait, my daughter, until you know the matter turned out for the man, Boaz, will not rest until it is settled today. And we see what Boaz did. He immediately got from the threshing floor, went to the town gate, the elders were around. But it's interesting as we start walking through. Um, his marriage to Ruth in order to, was in order to raise up a descendant to to redeem the land and redeem the name of Elimelech. It's, we don't go through that because it's not, the, the names aren't so important to us. So it's weird because Boaz is going to have a son with Ruth who's going to, going to inherit Elimelech's land. So basically, and, and I don't know because the law doesn't tell us, does he get both Boaz's land and that land? I don't know. Part of the first redeemer's issue may have been, because you have to remember, if, if Ruth doesn't marry, when Naomi dies, the guy, and I'll call him Jim, Jim, who's the closest in line, he's going to inherit the land anyway. He'll get it for free. Now he has to buy it, but he doesn't want to buy it because he says it will mess up his other inheritance. Now, we don't know what the other inheritance is. Part of it may be, I'm going to buy it, then my kid's going to get it, and I have no, I have no claim over it, and I want my kids to have it. Or, could be that if Jim redeems Ruth, then he's got the land, then now so if they have Ruth as a child through him, he's going to now come in and get part of his inheritance. We don't know why, but for whatever reason, he says, I'm willing to buy the land, but I'm not willing to have the woman. So, great. He says, look, you can have her. Go have at it. So, the marriage to Ruth is in order to raise up a descendant for Elimelech and his son Malon, not for necessarily for Boaz. So, the day that Boaz redeemed all that belonged to Elimelech, he, he redeems everything that belonged to Elimelech's heirs. So Boaz publicly acquired Ruth as a wife for the express purpose. He did the right thing. He actually did the righteous thing. Righteous thing. He made good choices. Right? He, we see good choices throughout. We saw in chapter 1, when he went to the field, he blessed the men that, his men that were working in the field. They blessed him back. He was a man of integrity. He was a man of faith. And he looked, he said, he could have slept with, Nate, with Ruth on the threshing floor and think about it. That could have consummated a marriage, but what would the town people have said? Been a lot of whispering. Yeah, did you hear about that? Every trampy old woman went in there. Boaz, can you believe Boaz would do that? You know there's a redeemer that's closer. On and, see, so instead of rumor, what do we see? Go to the end of chapter 4. It says, and all the people who were in the court said, we are witnesses and they started blessing them. May your house be built on Israel. May your house be the house like Perez. What blessed is the Lord who has not left you. Do you see, instead of people having talking about rumors behind the back, they're going, what a glorious day. 
Boaz is redeeming Ruth, is redeeming Naomi's name and Elimelech's name. And so instead of having rumors, we have blessings coming down. So his purpose, again, I'm not saying he didn't love Ruth. I think he did because he loved what Ruth was all about. Because he saw the same integrity and faithfulness in Ruth that he saw. Because see, here's, here's this woman comes from, from Moab. She's living with Naomi. Naomi, I clearly, I, I believe in my heart, I just see it in the story, everybody in town, because she's told everybody in town, I'm a miserable old woman. Everything, I came back empty. Don't even call me by my name, because Naomi means pleasant. God has put a bitter hand against me. So, isn't it interesting that we see the providence of God throughout this story? Watch this. In, um, so Boaz goes to the town gate. Alright? So immediately he says, I'm going to solve this problem. He goes to the town gate, but listen to, to the words. He says, now Boaz went up to the gate, he sat down, and behold, the Redeemer from whom Boaz was spoke about came passing by. Hmm, that's kind of an interesting, would you call that a coincidence? or the providential hand of God. Think about it. Go back to chapter 2, verse 3. Do you remember what happened in chapter 2? Ruth says, I'm going to go glean in the field because we got to have food and all you're doing is sitting around complaining and watching television. And so she says, I'm going out to the field. And remember what it said? And she happened to come to the field that belonged to Boaz. Of all the fields she could have gone to. We talked about, we saw the providence of God. She just walks out, sees the field, sees people glean and goes over and says, can I glean in your field? She says, yes. Happens to be Boaz. And guess what also happened that same day? Boaz happened to go to that field to check out what was going on. And he looks around and he says, hmm, who's that gal? He asked his, he asked his foreman, who's that gal? Oh, that's Ruth the Moabitess. Oh, that's the one I heard Naomi's daughter-in-law. I heard about her. She came all the way back to take care of Naomi. Isn't that awesome? So now we see the same thing. It just so happened that that guy came by right at that time when he got there and he said, I'll solve this problem. King James Version says this. It's really weird language. It says, Ho, such a one, turn aside and sit here. So they go, Ho, such a one, turn aside, sit here for a minute. And then there happen to be the elders around. Ten elders, sit down. Come here. But again, it's a gathering place. It's a divine appointment arranged by God because Boaz and Ruth made right choices. See, I, I don't believe that God... And, and again, we go through the story. It says that then... Because the, the words are pretty clear. When... In, check, in verse 13... I think it's 13. Uh, 13. So, yeah, it says, And the Lord enabled Ruth to conceive. We know she was previously married. We don't know. They were in Moab for 10 years. Did they get married the first year they got there? The last year they got there? We don't know. But typically a woman would have, would have had children right away. And so maybe she couldn't conceive. And it's interesting because when you look at how the women blessed him in verse 11, it says, May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, both of whom built the house of Israel. So you remember, Rachel and Leah and their, and their maidservants, Stab had 12 children, which established the 12 tribes of Israel. But if you go back and you read in Genesis chapter 30, both Leah and Rachel's wombs were barren until such time as God opened them up. You see the redemptive hand of God working through this? That's what we see here. So again, all I want to do is I just want to look and say, what does the Scripture tell me? The Scripture tells me that that God enabled her to, the Lord enabled her to conceive, which means he had closed her womb previously. And so we don't know, maybe Ruth was all upset. You know, am I, am I, gonna, am I not going to be a good woman because I can't conceive? I couldn't conceive with my first husband, and he died, and, and so maybe I can't even, and maybe he even in their conversations with Boaz maybe said, look, I know you want to redeem the family, but I don't even know if I can have kids. I'm barren. We see that concept throughout. Remember Abraham and Sarah. We see that concept throughout where what does God do? God didn't close Sarah's womb to be cruel. He closed Sarah's womb for timing, for timing so that he could say, look, it's it. So everybody could look around and go, Sarah's going to have a baby. She's like 120 years old. No way. <laughs> but God could do it. And do you see the difference here as... As, as, as Naomi is just bitter and looking at her circumstance, Ruth is moving forward and trusting God. I'm going to go to the field and glean. 
right? I'm going to follow this scheme that Naomi's told me to do. But remember, when she got to the threshing floor, she crawled up under his feet. And, and if you go back, and, and Naomi said, when you do, when he wakes up, he'll tell you what to do. Instead, Boaz said, who are you? And says, it's Ruth, your servant. Will you redeem me? And he looks and he says, I'm paraphrasing, wow. You would want me to redeem you? There's so many young, eligible, rich and poor men, but yet you come to me one and one. I would love to redeem you, Ruth, but there's somebody ahead of me. And you know what? I can, I can take care of this right now, but I'm going to follow what God says. Even though, and again, I believe he was absolutely in love with Ruth. Even though it may mean you will become the wife of another. I'm going to what? I'm going to do what's right. What God says. Look at the public nature of this. That again, back to my, my, my theory behind this, where I stand, is that everything on the threshing floor was done in secret of darkness. This is done in the light, in front of lots of witnesses. He did it the right way. And again, with, you go back to the law of the kinsman redeemer. Everything, they followed the detail. The guy, if he hadn't taken his sandal off, he could have come back later and said, well, I don't know that I really said that. No, you, you, you bound it. So by taking the sand law, it's kind of like taking out a piece of paper and having a notary there and saying, I give up my rights to redemption of Ruth and, and, and Naomi. And he would have signed it. They would have sealed it. And everybody, would have, the judge would have stamped it. So Boaz dealt kindly and honorably with the next of kin. He went to him and he did the right thing. The nearest kin was willing to redeem the land when he thought it was to his advantage. But he wasn't willing to redeem the woman. And again, we don't know why, but that was the decision he made. And, and we know, again, from the law that he didn't have to. Um, Boaz understood the that the, it was necessary to preserve the land for the house of Elimelech. And so it, it is an interesting that we see a contrast in characters. The nearest kin was just looking out for himself. Yeah, dude, if I can get the land, great. But I don't want to mess up all the inheritance. Then I got this other kid I got to raise, maybe. If, <coughs> can she even have kids? I don't know. On well, that, Boaz was seeking to serve not himself, but Naomi and Ruth and his, his cousin or whoever it was, Elimelech. In other words, what was he doing? Uh, sure, he was putting self last, others first. Who's that remind you of? Yeah, amen. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I had a question. Do you think that it's possible that the Redeemer, the, the first Redeemer, mm -hmm. was younger? Because in my study Bible it talks about he was afraid that if that was his firstborn, then his firstborn is going to be redeeming a Lemelech's line, not necessarily his. So I'm thinking that he was younger, Boaz was older, so Boaz may have already had an older son that would get all his inheritance, so having a baby with Ruth would mess that up. But if the other guy was younger, it would mess everything up if he oh, didn't already have a son. Absolutely. So, I mean, definitely he's still thinking of himself first. Correct. But I just wondered if you had... I don't, I, I don't know. I don't know. I think there's all kinds of ways it could be. Yes, mm -hmm. on, on how that is. But for whatever reason, he the land what he was willing to do the land, but he wasn't willing to do the woman because of some inheritance thing. I don't mm -hmm. know. Yes. So I take it. Um, I take it. Uh, Naomi never even tried to find the redeemer thing. Never even went into that scenario that uh, that Ruth is needs to be in to find a husband. Because Naomi was also a widow, her husband died, right. so that means that she could have found a um, redeemer right. to redeem her to carry his name on, but he hasn't. But she didn't, and I guess that's just well. I think I, I think at least in theory, it's yeah. it, it, in theory she's too old to have kids. Okay. That would, okay. I mean that would be that would be my view of it. All right. So in other words, she's not looking for a husband for herself. She's looking because if if if. If Ruth has a husband who has a baby, that solves the problem. She may have been too old. Because uh, remember, back in chapter 1, when she's talking to the uh, to Ruth and whoever the other gal was, or the other son, I don't remember, she said, what are you going to do, come back with me so that then I can have another son? Are you going to wait around until that son's old enough for you to marry? 
It's not going to work. So my thinking is she's she's a bitter old woman who probably is past childbearing years. Okay. Is, is my way of my view anyway. Now I was just wondering in uh, verse ten. Yes. When, uh, talks about um, you know Jacob's brothers are going to be the ones that are going to marry Ruth. Yeah. Is that Elimelech's first name or something like that? Who's Malon? Malon was their son. Was the that son who married Ruth? That was Ruth's husband. That died. No, I, I thought Elimelech. Elimelech was, was the father-in-law. Would have been Ruth's father-in-law. Elimelech was married to Naomi, and they had two sons. And Malon was the son. Oh, was Elimelech married to, married to Naomi. Elimelech. Yeah, Elimelech. 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 So it's not just blood, because obviously Ruth's blood is is not Naomi's blood, mm -hmm. but it's but it's it's all through the male line is how it goes through. Mm -hmm. So that's why she that's why she needed a redeemer to do that. Raymond, yes, <clears throat> I was reading Hosea and uh, came across this Hosea nine one. <clears throat> He's talking about Israel. Do not rejoice. O Israel, with joy like other people, for you have played the harlot against your God. You have made love for hire on every threshing floor. Interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Love for hire, right? Because again, you go back and you read the text. He freaks out when he sees a woman on the threshing floor. Not supposed to be there. That's a male dominant. And there's 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 multiple examples, not just on the threshing floor, but on the sheep shearing thing. In fact, we're going to see, well, we're not going to see because we're not going to go there. But I told you all last week, go read in Genesis about, uh, um, uh, what the world's name, oh, Tamar and, and Judah, and how she, she dressed up. As he was going to the sheep shearing, she dressed up as a prostitute because he wouldn't give her a son. And then he got her as the prostitute. She got that. And, and it's just, I mean, you talk about, you think y'all got family problems, man? These people got family. They messed up stuff, right? In other words, the, the yeah, the, the, cause Judah was the father-in-law of Tamar. And then he impregnates her and Perez is born. And through that comes the line of Jesus. So if you ever think about the idea of from a Jewish perspective, that Jesus would have to be a pure Jew? No way. He's not even close to a pure Jew. I mean, think about think about some of the women in, in his line. Rahab was a Gentile harlot, right? You got Tamar, who was also Gentile, who slept with her father-in-law because he wouldn't give her her son to allow him to marry. I mean, it just great. And Ruth, Ruth is a, is, is a Moabite. She's a Gentile as well in the direct line of Christ. So it helps me when I think... When I, when I think, well, has it always been God's plan for Jesus? Always, Yeah, it always has. That the Gentiles would come into the fold because they were part of the lineage of Jesus from the beginning. So, uh, so it's cool when we look at this, it, from, from my perspective, verses 11 through 17 is just a time for blessing. It's just it, it, it blessing. Look at 11 and 12. And the people who were in the court and the elders and called the witnesses, may the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah. Isn't it interesting? Rachel and Leah established the 12 tribes of Israel through their son. And yet these people, they're, they're not predicting, but they kind of are predicting that through this line is going to come redemption for Israel. Those who built the house of Israel, how would they know that this was going to build the house of Israel by this child of Ruth and Boaz, if it happened. At that point, they didn't even know if she could have kids. And that that would be in the direct line of David, the direct line of the Messiah. So it's cool when you look at it, at least it is for me, like Rachel and Leah. And again, if you want to go back and look at it, in Genesis chapter 30, in both instances, God opened their wombs and enabled them to conceive. So it's weird. That's not weird. It's God. So they're predicting so that they know, you know, because, and again, you got to remember that culturally, if you got a woman, and I'm just going to make this up, I'm going to say that, that Ruth married, married uh, Naomi's son, say she was 20, was 10 years, they married her early on, so she's in her late 20s, maybe, 30, and so I believe culturally people are looking around going, she ain't had no babies yet. But, I mean, can she not conceive? Maybe she, maybe she, maybe everybody knew. Yeah, I mean, I've never been able to conceive. And so they're saying, we want you to, we hope you are going to be, may the Lord bless you to be like Leah and Rachel, who did what? God opened their wombs and allowed them to conceive. And you know what that means is, God closed their wombs 
Why? For His purposes. You see? So in our own lives, when, I mean, as an analogy, when God closes our womb, or in other words, He, he hampers something that we think we want, we think is right, is God's timing perfect? Maybe it's not. I mean, maybe it's, maybe, no, no. His timing is perfect. Maybe He's closed that for a period of time so that then He can show the blessing later. Because it would have messed up the whole time <coughs> if she'd have gotten pregnant, if she'd have gotten pregnant before him. Everything would have been. In other words, there wouldn't be a need for a kindred redeemer coming back for a limb-legged field. It's, it's complicated. Um, but when we look at that, we just look and says, God enabled her to be able to conceive. So the blessings of the people at the gate. It's interesting because they ask for blessings on Ruth and they ask for blessings on Boaz. And you know what? It's interesting because when we go through and you look at when they come to Naomi, now Naomi gets this son and she's got a son, a grandson, um, and she's looking at this son and holding it. Isn't it interesting that it's kind of like the idea of they come to her and it's almost like they're, um, I'd say in verse 15 it says, may he also be the one to Naomi. Blessed is the Lord that's not left you without a redeemer today, and may his name be famous in Israel. It's almost like they're gently uh, scolding her to say, you've been sitting around as this bitter old woman for all these, for all this time. I don't know how long the time was. Weeks, months. We know it was through the barley harvest, so they started in the barley harvest. The barley harvest and wheat harvest are two months, uh, May and June. So at least for two months, she's been, I'm just a bitter person. So you can't just see her all hang dog looking down all the time. You know, the Lord's been horrible to me. And now they're looking at her and says, and they don't say bless you. They don't say may you be blessed. It says blessed is the Lord that He didn't leave you without a Redeemer today. And all we heard from you was, I don't have a Redeemer. I don't have a Redeemer. Woe is me. Woe is me. You know anybody like that? Mm -hmm. uh, the blessings assume that God would produce an offspring for them. That's why verse 13 is significant. It's interesting, the village women in verse 14, they don't praise Naomi, they praise God for what He has done. And they didn't praise her for, for her thing. Because remember what she said. She said that she had come back to Bethlehem empty-handed. She refused to be called Naomi. And now these women praise God as they do what? As they set the baby on her lap that she's going to help raise. And it's interesting because the women, these town women, are the ones who named the baby. Isn't that weird? Named the baby. So, and they named him Obed, which means what? Servant. Obed means servant. That's the son. So they come up with this great name. And ultimately, he's in the line of Jesus, who was the ultimate servant. Right? Because Jesus put self last and others first. That's why he went to the cross. How could Naomi possibly see herself as being abandoned and empty-handed by God? at this point. She's been blessed by God. The child was in one sense her child. It was the future. It was preserving her family line. The child was not only welcomed and embraced, uh, but they, like I said, they named him servant, which is so foreshadowing of everything to come. Um, so as we go and remember, always, the book of Ruth was written, it says in chapter 1, verse 1, it says it was, it was in the time of the judges. In the time of the judges, everybody did what was right in their own eyes. And Again, I believe that we see Naomi exemplifies that statement. Because along with Elimelech, I don't know who made the decision, but probably joint, they left the promised land to go to Moab because they didn't trust that the Lord was going to provide from the famine that was going on there in, in Bethlehem. And remember, when they're away in Moab, the boys get married, all the men die, and then Naomi, you remember why she came back to Bethlehem? Because she heard the famine had been lifted. There was food. But isn't it interesting? Boaz never left. And the famine would have affected Boaz just as much as it would have a But Boaz was a man of God. And he stood by and he said, God's going to provide. And there's a remnant. There's always a remnant of God's people. So when we read the book of Judges or you read the book of Ruth and it says and everybody was doing right, what was right in their own eyes, that's true. But some were still doing righteous things in their own eyes. So there was always a remnant. And I'm not saying Boaz was the only one. I'm sure there were others there. But Bethlehem, Bethlehem means house of bread. And he stayed. They made, Naomi made wrong decisions. She made a decision to leave the promised land to go to Moab. She did what was right in her own eyes instead of saying, wait a minute, instead, maybe what God needs me to do is to turn towards him and trust that he's going to provide at some point. 
Boaz did. Because again, Boaz had a field, we know that, maybe multiple fields. Well, we know he had multiple fields, so he was wealthy. Right? But the famine, by the way, famine affects, it doesn't matter how much money you have, famine's famine in a day like that. So it's not like, hey, I don't have enough money, I'm so poor I can't go to the store to buy something. No, it's like there ain't nothing at the store to buy. Because there is no wheat, there is no barley. All those things going on. But you know what? Maybe Boaz shifted gears. And he said, okay, we don't have any grain, but let's go figure out a way to catch fish. Or let's go shoot an animal. Or whatever it was. I don't know. But they stuck it out. So in doing this, Naomi is the backdrop of doing what's right in their own eyes. Ruth and Boaz, their backdrop is doing what's right in God's eyes. And sticking to the plan. Book of Ruth gives us cause for hope. Not because men are good, but because God is setting the stage for hope. So even in the worst of time, God preserves this remnant of people. So, um, both Ruth and Judges, um, we see God always comes around with His plan to those people that are still faithful. The fulfillment of God's purposes and promise depends on what? The goodness of Right? And the gratefulness of God, not for on us. We're just there to trust. God, if, if Romans uh, 8.28 says that God causes all things to work together for our good and for, our, for His glory, but not necessarily for what we want. What we should see here is the unseen hand of God, that He was moving this whole time, to bring Ruth and Boaz together in the right way where Naomi was trying to subterfuge it in the wrong way. When Boaz redeemed Elimelech's land and he took Ruth as his wife, the people did what? They praised God. They praised Boaz. They praised God and said, may God continue to bless you. Why? For making right choices. The people could see it. They didn't know what happened on the threshing floor. They didn't need to know. What they saw was people of integrity doing what God's called. And um, just like Naomi and her family chose to live among the Moabites, and again, you've got to go back to the whole thing. If they were good Jews, good Israelites, why in the world would they want their sons to marry Moabite women? I mean, that, that's not what they're supposed to do. I mean, if they know the law at all, if they know God's word at all, I mean, they weren't supposed to do that. So that, do you see the bad choices they keep making? They said, first bad choice, we don't trust God, we're going to go to Moab and find food. Well, what happens in that bad decision? Our sons fall in love with Moabite women because we're living in the land of Moab. And now they end up marrying Moabite women, which they're not supposed to do. So you see, the bad choices keep going. And sometimes bad choices, you know, choose to sin, choose to suffer. Guess what? The old man died, the boys died. Now I'm stuck, what do I do? I don't have anything. Thank goodness she had Ruth who said, you will be mine, right? Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. I won't leave you till the day I die. But that bad choice that Naomi made to go ended up having her son marry a Moabite woman, mm -hmm. and it needed to have that Moabite woman. So that it wasn't. It, it was God works through the bad choice, I guess. Well, sure He does. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. He yeah. worked through that bad choice, even though she made the bad choice. He worked through Tamar when she yeah. dressed up as a prostitute, sleeping with her father-in-law. Yeah. Look at that. He works through all of our bad choices. Yeah, amen. <laughs> amen. It's the redemption. And I think that's what we see when the women at the end of this, and, and they say, the women say, blessed is the Lord who has not left you without a redeemer today. And you can almost insert there, in spite of your bad choices. He's faithful in all of it. No, that's exactly right. Yeah, oh no, he redeems. He redeems. It's a matter of, are we going to get redeemed kicking and screaming and making bad choices that cause a lot of hurt? Or are we going to be redeemed by making good choices that bring about happiness? Right? Again, that's why Boaz, I mean, look, I believe 100% Boaz is in love with this young gal. And not only that, she says, hey, I want you to marry me. And, and, and instead, he said, there's somebody else. And I just, I just, again, I read in color, man. I look at that and I see him go, I can tell you this, there's somebody else. i got to go see him first. And you know what? He may redeem you. 
and, and you know, and I know he's going, hold on, Lord, don't let this guy redeem him. Lord, don't let this guy redeem him. No, don't let him, don't let him redeem him. mine. Don't let him redeem him, right? That's the prayer he's praying. But again, because he's such a godly man, I think at the same time, he says, don't let this, don't let Jim redeem her, but your will be done. Why do I say that? Because he's a kinsman redeemer. Do you see? He's a type of Christ. So what did, what did Jesus say to the Father in the garden? Man, if you can take this cup away from me, I don't want to do it. But thy will be done. That's what Boaz's prayer was in this. The crises we find in the book of Judges are no, and Ruth are no different than the crises we have today. Christians are tempted to compromise by blending with the godliness of the pagan cult, the godlessness of the pagan culture around us. Um, all these things are the same issues. The tests, the trials, means that God uses them to strengthen His saints. So see, again, reading through the story and into the story, what do we see? We see Boaz made good choices, and what happened? He went through the test and the trials. Am I going to flee when the famine comes? And they used it as a means. He strengthened him. So I can see Boaz as the guy when the famine's there, he's the guy who's praying, saying, Lord, you know, just like the prophets, you read the prophets, turn back. I hope our people, if our people will just turn back to you, I know you will redeem us. How did he know that? Because it's in the time of the Judges, he could look back through 22 chapters, for lack of a better term, of the book of Judges and see every time the people got away from God. Because, again, he would have been a man. And culture's passed down. History was passed down. And so when he's sitting there, if you theorize that this is towards the end of the book of Judges, he could be looking back at all the redemption that happened all the way back through. Think of all the Judges that had come along. God pulled his hand back from the people said, y'all will not be knuckleheads, go ahead. And then he would raise up a judge who would do that. So he knew that. So Boaz thinking, you know what? I'm just going to be faithful during this famine and I'm going to turn to people and say, look, the famine is because we're not doing what God's called us to do. And if we'll do what God calls us to do, He'll lift the famine up. It's the same thing here today. It's no different for us. The, we're, we're not dealing with a physical famine of food, but we're dealing with a famine of, godly, a famine of godliness. And so the question is, do we stand up against that or do we just blend with it? Well, in this church, we're standing against it. We're not going to be like all the other churches. They're going to put up rainbow flags and say we're all inclusive. Everything's good. You can be a boy. You can be a girl. You can change that if you want to. All the things that go along with that. We're going to stand for what God's Word says. Even though it may bring hatred upon us. And I mean, I believe it's coming in this country. We're already seeing it in so many areas, in so many places. Federal government's gone after a surgeon and a nurse in Texas because they, they, they blew the whistle in Texas Children's Hospital that was still doing trans and, and hormone stuff with kids that they were not supposed to by law. They were hiding it. They blew the whistle on it. And the FBI showed up at their door last week. Come on now. They're going to show up at our door when we say, pick your subject. Sex outside of marriage is wrong. Homosexuality is a sin. Oh, can't say that. Then they'll come after us. I think Ruth, and here's the key, yeah, one of the keys, is I think Ruth and Boaz delighted in doing what God said, in following God's will, even when it was tough, right? On the other hand, Naomi, she could just sit back and complain at the circumstances. And so look at some ideas of where we exercise faith. Throughout the scriptures, it's there. A farmer had to exercise faith when he left a portion of his field for the poor. What if he said, you know what, we've been in famine, so therefore I haven't made any money for the last several years because of the famine, and should I really leave quarters for the poor people? I need the money for me. Um, you had to exercise uh, faith by leaving your land fallow every seven years. Again, that's in the law. You had to exercise faith by refusing to go out and labor in your field on the Sabbath. What if there was a storm coming? And if you didn't get the field, if you didn't get the crop in, then it was going to go bad. But you followed by faith. You said, God's going to provide. Ruth exercised faith by leaving her family to dwell in Israel. Boaz exercised faith when he gave the nearest kin the right of first redemption over the field and over Ruth. And he exercised faith by fathering a son who would be what? An heir of his kinsman, not of his. Carrying on that line. Uh, doing what is right in our own eyes is living by sight. Doing what is right in God's eyes requires faith and trust. 
right? And for we cannot see how he is doing the right, how, how doing the right thing will produce what God has promised. But we have to trust by doing what? We go back and we think of the book of Ruth. And we say, they made righteous choices. And God provided. I didn't provide perfect everything that they wanted necessarily. Because he doesn't promise a perfect life for us. But he says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Walk by faith, not by sight. And trust me. And seek me. And you'll find me. Amen?